and we're live. Hello, everybody. Hello, Lisa. Hi, Josh. Hello, everyone. <laughs> Dark Ozarks, Wednesday night. Uh, winter weather advisory for the Ozarks. Yes. Lots of <laughs> sleep. Yeah, it's pretty nasty. It's pretty. It's pretty nasty. Yeah. Good <laughs> night to talk about creepy subjects. <clears throat> it is a good night to talk about creepy subjects. Haunted forests and UFOs. <laughs> How we ended and, up deciding those two subjects, I, you know. <laughs> or, or possibly UFOs in a haunted forest. Yeah, that'd be even better, wouldn't it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'd run. Uh, <laughs> it's <clears throat> a lot of, mm, lot of elements. What do you think it is? about forests that gets people thinking about hauntings well for one thing it's dark mm -hmm. dark um often disorienting mm -hmm. um i think loss of a sense of control so uh yeah. it's easier to imagine things that are beyond your control being there i think i think that's a lot of it what do you think i think those are i think those are very fair um some of it may be you know that that primeval question of survival in the back of our minds mm -hmm. that the the farm for example the the farm and the field were where it was safe it's where you could see what was going on uh the forest is where there is mystery there's question there is risk um, that sort of thing it is and more likely uh, dangerous animals too yes <clears throat> as as we've certainly seen mm, that still stirs up a lot of uh of uh <laughs> feelings <laughs> and a lot of emotion uh in, in regards to the idea of apex predators within our midst mm -hmm. anyone that's interested go find the find the posts about uh panthers and the ozarks uh on the page and read the comments absolutely <clears throat> co-authored that article <laughs> <laughs> i liked it <laughs> it was a great article that was that was a, a a really fun collaboration of course co-authored with uh uh historian clint lacy and the artwork at the top uh was done by curtis copeland of the hillcrofters Curse always does a good job. Always does a fantastic job. And there are photos. Uh, one of the big questions that people have in regards to Black Panthers, uh, how come there are no photos? There are photos indeed on that article. Yeah. <clears throat> but of course, we're not here to debate that particular issue. We're here to talk about UFOs, something that's been uh, absolutely settled. <laughs> Yes, the two the two empirically settled questions. <laughs> Black Panthers and UFOs um, in haunted forest. <clears throat> They're coming back to the forest question. <clears throat> I don't know. I, 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 I don't know the answer to this. I don't know which came first, the chicken or the egg in this regard, uh, in terms of European settlement and our collective mindset did did we become frightened of the forest because we read Grimm's fairy tales or is it simply natural for people within certain framework to be frightened of the forest? Also the peasantry of Germany, present day Germany, who contributed to Grimm's fairy tales? Well, I think, I think those are factors and another, and also for settlers that came from the Isles, um, most uh, by the time mm -hmm. that people were immigrating, most of the forests were king's land um yep. and were basically forbidden for the average person to be yes. in so so they you know it was forbidden it was the taboo you know and if you got caught uh uh hunting there you usually you were subject to death penalty so yeah <clears throat> because the state owned owned it and everything in it more precisely the king yes mm -hmm. mm. there's a great bugs bunny 
Uh, <laughs> great Bugs Bunny episode with that, I but I digress. <laughs> you, you, <laughs> yes, we do. We, too much coffee today. <laughs> I think it's the coffee. Uh, <clears throat> but something that to me has been very striking about <clears throat> a lot of the the gathering of haunted forest tales for the Ozarks is that there is a a lyrical quality and a lot of <sighs> difficult to nail down folklore or sort of that traveling folklore show the folklore of the Isles, the folklore of Appalachia, the folklore of Middle America cropping up again in association with the dark of the forest. Well, and, and traditionally we, we've told dark tales in, in the forest, Hansel and Gretel, uh, mm -hmm. Rapunzel, Snow White, etc. cetera. So. It's, <clears throat> and, you know, coming into that, an, an area that I really want to get back to um, that we don't have it on our notes, but it made me think of it just as we were talking is the sunk lands um, yeah. uh, around Acres Ferry. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> it would be east of Summersville and Hartshorn. And you don't get much more of a German name than Hartshorn. I love it. No, <laughs> not, not at all. <laughs> uh, but it's, it's, a, it's a bottom marshland. It's it massive. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, an area of <clears throat> of low river marsh and uh, interspersed with hardwoods and below the, the rocky bluffs in an area that <clears throat> mm, does not have a lot of marsh. Yes. <laughs> it's, it's ironic. There's a lot of tales in the Ozarks that supposedly are related to marshland where there's no marshland. But... Yes. And in this case, the sunk lands are a marsh. Um, and, uh, you know, there, there's tales that your compasses will start, your compass won't work properly. Mm -hmm. In the sunk lands, it's very easy to get lost. I know there's a lot of stories associated with that. I've been briefly one afternoon through a portion of the sunk lands. It's beautiful. Uh, got to see a massive black snake. Uh, and <laughs> the river's gorgeous in through there. But I can see um you know i think i think the out of control element mm -hmm. and the idea that if you if you go into this space the risk that you are taking is that you will lose control exactly and that there there may be things that um that you're unaware of and that can manipulate you or your reality yes <clears throat> And <clears throat> whether whether those things are are natural naturally occurring phenomena, or simply weird things out of place, uh, all the way to mm, paranormal or spiritual phenomena mm -hmm. that could very well mean you harm. That's the other aspect, right? And the fact that you don't know just makes it even more frightening. And that uh, really, you know, lets let your mind wander in in a um, in a lot of different directions. Fayetteville's ghost holler. I, I found this interesting uh, Northwest Arkansas homepage dot com referenced it, but the story is a little bit different than the one that I'm familiar with. Right. Right, it's it's a it's a variation, but it uh, specifies that it's that same location as it the does. as the Fayetteville Bride story. The it Burning does. Bride. We, we, right, the Burning Bride. We've talked a number of times for people who might not be familiar. Um, uh, the daughter of a well-to-do <clears throat> Fayetteville founder settler, um, on her wedding night, her Venetian lace dress catches on fire and she burns to death and run, runs out of the house and and catches the the forest on fire yes <clears throat> which is you know just adds to the horror of the story and the that element of you know highlighting what is a very mm, what i would consider to be a very 
British uh, folkloric element, uh, mm -hmm. danger and death yeah. on the thresholds of life, whether that is birth, uh, whether that is the uh, a marriage. wedding, a marriage. Mm -hmm. um, and I think you could also put in the, uh, the death omens themselves or the idea of odd things happening shortly prior to someone's death. Mm -hmm. uh, I've always found that interesting, the, the idea of uh, glass breaking, the idea of uh, certain animals acting strangely, uh, animal Don't phenomena, the, uh, uh, the, the, the angel crowns found in the pillows, mm -hmm. things that <clears throat> I, I think in our, in our more detached industrialized age that we are less either less aware of or we're simply less associated with and right. that um those are and, and and one of my favorites um clocks clock stopping mm -hmm. you stop the clock when 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 the person passes mm -hmm. so. and <clears throat> and cover mirrors yes and and some of that uh i've experienced and it is unsettling mm -hmm. that's in it but uh, <clears throat> uh along with that and, and i think that this falls more into our mm, urban lore um it, but i i find it really fascinating especially since i've been to the cemetery uh the story that some of the statues in the confederate cemetery in in ghost holler uh, are reported to come alive and and that's that's always interesting because there there, there are other stories i know of of uh, uh statues or or tombstones uh, moving or coming to life in different cemeteries throughout the ozarks um often if there's a statue of an angel the story will be that the angel angel will move uh maybe even walk around or will cry, those kinds of things. <clears throat> now, <laughs> I, I think there's, there's a sort of a, a universal response, a universal emotional response to that kind of a story, which is, yikes, I'm running away. <laughs> uh, I, I don't know, I, I, I don't, so. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, I'm 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 primarily thinking of the weeping angels from Doctor Who. <laughs> okay. But in in terms of pop culture, this <clears throat> this does bring up something that's not on our list uh, discussion point for tonight. But I'm going to bring it up anyway because it's, <laughs> it is associated with this. It's something I would like to explore. I'm, I'm going to make a note <clears throat> for us to explore. Okay. later for another episode but this subject in and of itself and <clears throat> i was so here's my here's my line of line of thoughts um first of all Anne rice second of all the interview with the vampire um third of all the movie adaptation which of course rice initially was not terribly thrilled with mm -hmm. uh and <clears throat> but i like both a lot i like I, I i did like both but I, I admit I prefer the book. <laughs> I do too. Um, now there's a moment. Now here's my here's my my point. <clears throat> there is a moment in the film that it's during um, Louis's transformation, mm -hmm. and he looks up at the 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 angel statue in the garden, and its eyes open. Yeah. Uh, this is not in the book. Yeah. Uh, the book is much more, I would say, contextually precise. Yeah. In in terms of and and better thought out. <laughs> and 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 I feel that in on one hand that the there's an element of this angel statue opening its eyes that is a bit acontextual it it occurs it it doesn't directly say anything into the narrative it doesn't show up again right um, 
that it doesn't really seem to go anywhere. And I mean, it, it almost to me almost leaves this, 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 you know, is he just hallucinating? And possible. It is to vampires hallucinate um, and, and do androids dream. But <laughs> I love Blade Runner, but <laughs> the, the, uh, the, there, there's something about it. So I, I read uh, a pretty good critical analysis of the film that really highlighted a number of key points that, you know, was, was, a, was a pretty critical, critical take. And one of them was about the, the angel statue going basically, that was goofy, it did, did nothing, it went nowhere. Uh, it wasn't in the book and I'm very dismissive of it. And I get that. But there's also something I, I would consider universally gothic and unsettling about the imagery of that. Well, yeah. And, and that's how I would take it is that, you know, because you, the movie, it's a visual form. So having something as a striking visual effect of, you know sort of boom reality's changing <laughs> so. yes and 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 to me um that that really jumped out i've been to the confederate cemetery in fayetteville east fayetteville and and the idea that there are stories associated with the statues there coming alive was really unique it jumped out to me but you know i like i said i can see it i know other i, I know similar type stories from other cemeteries in the region so um mm -hmm. but again i think it just goes to that primal fear of something that is just not supposed to happen can happen <laughs> yes. and can happen yeah. when you are uh, vulnerable in a vulnerable place and exposed and etc. Agreed. No, and and in the Flasher movie um, feeling, you know that. You know. <laughs> and 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 that actually that brings me to another thought. Um, now, just sort of coming off of this, this isn't really forest, uh, but Little Rock Mount Holly Cemetery corner of Broadway and 12th in Little Rock, Arkansas, a lot of paranormal um, mm -hmm. association with that apparitions of people in period clothing, bright lights, mists, the sound of a flute, and also statues mysteriously located to lawns of nearby houses. Well, that would be interesting to wake up and take your trash out in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> it then it would. We got another statue in the lawn. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's back. Um, certainly could be very unsettling. Now, yeah. coming off of the uh, of the cemetery theme, and I'm going to tie this back to the forest for people who may be unfamiliar with the Ozarks woods. It is very common to be hiking and run across an abandoned cemetery abandoned cemetery or just abandoned uh homesteads foundations etc that um and sometimes those homesteads may just have a single grave out there that happens yes <clears throat> or or handful um oh my gosh matthew's homestead east of chadwick comes to mind um james matthews was one of the three bald numbers hanged on the square in springfield may of 1889 and it's in the middle of a, a Mark Twain forest, mm -hmm. and and it's a homestead, and the the house the the cabin is gone, but the family cemetery is out front, and mm -hmm. honestly, I was there at dusk. I I found it to be one of the warmest, most peaceful places that I've ever been. I mm -hmm. I think that I think they were happy to be together, which is very poignant to me. Um something that we have, have I don't know if we've discussed a lot on Dark Ozarks you and I have discussed a lot which is that, that of all the locations for paranormal 
paranormal activity, cemeteries are often the least rather than the most. Uh, by and large, yes, uh, in my opinion, in, in my experience, and a lot of people would probably fight me over that, but um, but usually they are, unless that something else has happened to create something unsettled. Yes. You know, a murder took place there, or unmarked graves, <laughs> or um, an area where, where there was a cemetery and headstones were moved, but the graves weren't. It's something along those lines. As you, yes. were, as you were talking about Chadwick um, and Matthew's grave, it also made me think of the Sherwood um, Cemetery um, from the burning of Sherwood in Jasper County because the site of the town, that it was burned during the war um, and we've covered that in other episodes, but it's all on private land now and, and it, it's very grown up and mature. And of course that was 160 years ago. Um, and so you would have no idea walking through there that there had been actually the third largest town in the county there, uh, except for the fact that occasionally you run across a bit of a foundation. And if you're lucky enough to be there in the springtime, um, irises will come up in rows. So you see exactly where houses were, things like that. But the cemetery is there. And so you, you walk out of the trees and, and suddenly you're in the cemetery surrounded by trees. And it's very peaceful, even though um, a lot of violence went on right around there and there's mass graves right down the road at the cemetery, um, et cetera, from, the, from there. Um, and ironically, a cousin of uh, Abraham Lincoln is buried there as well. Wow. <clears throat> I did not realize that. Mm -hmm. That now, and, and I which think is, that which is ironic because it was Confederate towns. Yes, <laughs> there there is a culturally, I think socioculturally, there is an interesting split <clears throat> in terms of overall mm, response or mm, emotional reaction to cemeteries. Yeah, before. I would say before the 1960s, 70s, and after, uh, yeah. I, I tend to associate our admittedly golden age of 1980s horror films um, with, with some of this, mm -hmm. but, <clears throat> you know, my, my, uh, my mom and, and grandparents <clears throat> grew up my mom grew up, you know, with the, with the tradition on Decoration Day, uh, which was the old name for Memorial Day, that mm -hmm. you went to the cemeteries, oftentimes picnicked in the cemeteries. Yeah. And this was a, a continuation of the memory of remembering your loved ones and honoring your loved ones. And it was treated, I think, emotionally somewhere between uh, a family heirloom and a park. I think very much so they were public they were public spaces in a, in a very real sense for the living um picnicking was very common uh people would probably be mortified today but people would go to the cemetery all the time and and picnic and and just walk etc um and uh, I mean I still I still go on decoration day all the time anyway but um and then um I'm rather fond of, of going to uh Mount Hope Cemetery and walking anyway because it's it's just beautiful <laughs> and most people think that's really creepy but actually there's more people who do that than, than you would imagine mm -hmm. and <clears throat> you know in a, in a situation where especially if there's if there are family plots um, of loved ones you go maybe you leave flowers um, you go to visit essentially mm -hmm. it is the is you know, the, the traditional mindset mm -hmm. and the idea, and I find this particularly interesting in this particular vein of sort of middle American thought that you, that this is a very special and, and actually a very positive environment. Oh, definitely. And so, so the idea of it being 
you know, uh, creepy or horrific or hands coming up out of the ground to, to drag you down or ghosts appearing from behind the trees and this sort of thing, uh, almost iconoclastic in its structure. It is, but, but again, I think, I think um, it's cemeteries that are abandoned that tend to have that feel um, <laughs> or, and people worrying about those kind of things. Usually the, the very well-trafficked um, and uh, manicured cemeteries, mm. people aren't too worried about you know, corpses coming out <laughs> of graves type things, but the overgrown uh, cemeteries where you can't read the, the stones anymore, that, that's where that comes in. I think it's because it is that unfamiliar environment that you're not used to, just like the forest. Agreed. And, and in some case, many cases for, for those, they are also uh, in forest. A lot of them are, yes. Uh, or, or more specifically, there was originally a community and that, and then consequently there was a cemetery and then the community died out, and the cemetery remains, and the forest came to, to say hello. That's true. And, and along the Missouri Kansas border, we have a, a, a number of those cemeteries that it wasn't that the, the town just died out, but they were burned to the ground during Bloody Kansas. And so yeah. you'll be going driving through, and Georgia City, which is only a few miles from my house. Um, um, is is one that you it, it's um uh, all farmland now and to look around you'd never know there was a town there the only thing there is a cemetery mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that <clears throat> now as a as a counterpoint to this we do have a lot of stories a lot of lore that predates sort of our middle american 19th and early 20th century association with cemeteries which is yeah. very positive. We have a lot of, of traditional lore and certainly Gothic literature that does paint cemeteries as very creepy places. Mm -hmm. That's true. <laughs> that is true. It's, there's, <clears throat> there's a couple for myself, especially because I grew up with my, my mom's stories of cemeteries as, as positive locations. Mm -hmm. I, I do not typically have a, a negative response uh there is some very unique energy we we've, we've talked about this at length so we won't dig into this here but some very unique energy at peace cemetery very positive place though uh for a variety of reasons and uh yes. another enough that is a i would say a wooded ensconced cemetery that does bear conversation for tonight is the one at newtonia Oh, definitely. Yes. The Civil War Cemetery, um, which I guess a good plug. April 23rd, we will be at the Ritchie Mansion. And it's my understanding that we will also be going to the cemetery. So. Excited about that. It's going to be fun. One of, Newtonia is one of my favorite places. Uh, so much history. <clears throat> but there is there is a lot of energy at Newtonia. Yes. I mean, you, you cross a, a threshold just getting to the cemetery, you know, a very uh, real threshold as far as <laughs> meandering <laughs> down the road that it, it becomes no longer a road, basically, and then literally through archways and, and into the space and lots of energy, very watchful. Very, very watchful. And... <clears throat> Something that goes beyond just the anticipation that, oh, I'm standing in a cemetery, so there must be ghosts here. No, no, no you, you definitely have the sense that you're being watched. Yeah. <laughs> now, I am going, to, <laughs> I was thinking about this. We um, reviewed a lot of information <clears throat> uh, about ghost towns, uh, particularly mm -hmm. uh, Rush, Arkansas, near uh, Yelville in the, in the Buffalo uh, national river space and and there are there are accounts of it supposedly being on it but is that i was yeah, curious there, about that yeah there there are accounts but they tend to be again sort of those ephemeral vague 
you know, I, you know, I saw something, uh, or I thought I heard something or shadows move, that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, so it is, it is a little hard to know, uh, objectively what was going on or just if they got creeped out because it's a very well preserved uh, ghost town over yes. a large a large number of acres um yes that, in the middle of the forest so I, I could see people kind of freaking themselves out it it would not be it would not be difficult um 1300 acres yeah uh, <laughs> that's it, a lot <laughs> it is a lot uh and 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 uh rush really began in in the 1880s uh and it and it was zinc mining well but originally they they started originally looking for silver based on the spanish uh, legends yes <laughs> which um i i think is is fun um just the fact that the the legends of lost silver mines Mm -hmm. was so powerful as to as to get people's interest up the you know on a on a more pragmatic note we we have that uh essentially zinc belt yeah that runs catty cornered from your part of the ozarks just south of me here in in hollister um lead and zinc and then on down into Arkansas. And plus, plus, the, plus the one that's over on the east side of Missouri too. Yes. And that, you know, starting starting along in hmm, mid 1800s, <clears throat> miners, assayers looking for the next big strike. Mm -hmm. uh, whatever it was that they could find. This is uh, an aside going back to my childhood but uh, mm -hmm. a small bit of my childhood died on the on the day that i discovered was told that just because a location is called a ghost town doesn't automatically mean there are ghosts there because uh, i was i was quite excited uh about the possibility of a ghost town until somebody said it's just an abandoned town. There's no promise of ghosts. And I was a bit heartbroken. Um, False advertising. <laughs> <laughs> very much so. Now, <laughs> I think the, the um, uh, you know, the last several years of our work has rekindled my general hope uh, <laughs> and, 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 <laughs> and brought back a little bit of my childhood spark because you come to find out there's many places with ghosts. And that's actually very, makes me very happy. <laughs> <laughs> and some of them do happen to be ghost towns. So. And they do. So I, I want to, I really want to go down to Rush. And I, I really I, want to. <laughs> you, there's one thing I want to throw in there uh, that yeah. I, I wasn't, I wasn't naysaying the idea that it was, uh, that it's haunted because in fact, uh, based on, places in my area from the mining days uh there often are a lot of hauntings associated with mining uh, yeah because there were a lot of accidents a lot of tragic deaths etc yes and um one of um one of the uh, most interesting ghost stories that uh out of the joplin area it's fairly old i tell it in in haunted joplin in the beginning it was actually in an abandoned mining field here uh in a mine shack and um man who it, it was about 1910 and he was working here um to get money to pay for medical school and in his you know autobiography he writes years later at, at the end of his medical career he recounts the story that basically um, the story was that this mining shed in the middle of mine, you know, minefield uh, was haunted. And so, you know, the guys would dare each other to spend the night in it, that kind of thing. And he thought, this is silly. He poo pooed it, you know, that kind of thing. So he went out there and uh, in the middle of the night, and he stays awake. He says he's sitting in a chair in the middle. It's a, just a log cabin. 
and all of a sudden it starts getting pelted with rocks and so he's sure that someone has snuck up and they're trying to scare him he goes out and it's you can see he says you can see for a quarter mile in all directions there's no one out there and what he finds is that rocks that have hit the side of the house and some that have come through the broken windows they're all smooth river rock but not chat from the field and so the river rock he said it had to have come at least a mile away uh and in the course of all this he starts hearing fighting and uh someone being beat up and he compares it to um uh, the stories of vigilante uh Balnabra type groups and so uh, these kind of places hauntings kind of go along with it so it would not surprise me that there would be a haunting there i just don't know same and i love that story yeah it's one of my favorites actually. <laughs> and and with that is that that unique uh transitional shift between the non-corporeal and the corporeal interacting with one another yes uh you know the idea that and this is <laughs> not to freak everybody out but you know, one of the things is ghosts are non-corporeal, so they can't hurt you unless they pick up a rock and chunk it at you. Exactly. Which, those types of things happen as well. They do. They can happen. They, they can happen. And, you know, there's times people get scratched or whatever, too. Mm-hmm. And <clears throat> rolling our background over to the Springfield area, uh, cold spots, apparitions, voices of soldiers in wooded areas at wilson's creek yes or more specifically wilson's creek battlefield from the battle the rather extensive battle that took place in august of 1861 yes certainly all of those things happen um uh phantom soldiers phantom cavalry um actually on blake hill um next to where uh uh, General Lyons was killed. Often people will experience seeing soldiers in Calvary. Um, actually, I think one, one of my favorite ghost tales there is actually people saying that they will see a young woman carrying a wooden pail of water towards the Ray House and mm. assume that she's a reenactor, et cetera, and then to find out there are no reenactors there. <laughs> <laughs> and that whether it whether it's gettysburg or um or, or wilson's creek other major locations um that seems to be a recurring theme <clears throat> in in light of historic reenactment and mm -hmm. and sometimes uh, what seems to be an increase in paranormal activity in response to historic reenactment. That can be. Um, I, I, I know. I know at Kendrick House when we've had reenactors and they shoot off cannons, we have spikes and activities. So. <laughs> that. Um, I had an interesting experience down at Prairie Grove, uh, in Arkansas. Uh, once to we were actually investigating we um had a night investigation there with another team and um and walking along one of the paths through a very wooded area um and there's three of us and we, we're standing on the trail still and we hear someone walking and you hear uh branches off to our right but be brushed past um and the steps go past us and then on to the other side um and uh, right about that time also uh there were sounds of uh phantom cannon fire mm. wow which is not not intense no it was it was pretty neat it was, it was neat <laughs> and there is <clears throat> i'm just thinking of the list you know something that uh, as in investigators slash researchers that we have to take into account is there's un an uncountable number of skirmishes that have happened to what is now everything from 
farm to suburbia to downtown urban to yeah. complete wooded uh, forest throughout the Ozarks that there simply is no record for. That said, <clears throat> there's a number of significant battles um, throughout the, the Ozarks region that, that are documented. Mm -hmm. And there, there seems to be very significant activity associated with all of these locations. A great many of them. And, and I, again, a lot of energy is expended, um, uh, not only human energy, uh, but just the, the firepower, everything. And it seems to be when you have events like that, whether it's a battle, whether it may be a tornado, whether it's uh, a flood, anything like that is, tends to have activity linger. It does. And I, I think that's really, it's fascinating. I still keep, it shouldn't surprise me when I, you know, even now when I run across, you know, civil war battle information or skirmishes uh, or deaths in, in areas that I just, I just physically have not associated with and uh, working yeah. on a number of those leads. I know we are working on them, even ones that haven't been documented as much. And it's just, it's fascinating. It's, it's exciting. And I, I, I really love it. So if anybody has anything that they want to share in that regard, please do. Uh, we love to hear those stories. Probably about time while we still have time to switch to our second subject. Yes. <laughs> UFOs. UFOs. You know, oh, we didn't even, we didn't even mention the Madonna. <laughs> Oh, oh, well, <laughs> I'll, let, let's close on the Madonna. Yes. It's the, our bit of lore, uh, which I think is a little bit, I don't necessarily say shaky, but I think this lore could be associated with a number of regions, mm -hmm. is in essence, and I love the term that was our Madonna, uh, but it's very sad. A yeah. young woman whose infant has died mm -hmm. and she either dies from grief or has killed herself mm -hmm. and the two of them as ghosts walking the ridges of the ozark forest yes uh, often noted to be in the rolla area yeah yeah our, our particular lead um comes from march Twain forest base you know from rolla and, 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 and as we mentioned over on Instagram with this, uh, I, I do think it does make sense if it comes out of the Civil War period because um, there was a headquarter, a federal headquarters in Rolla throughout the war um, and a large refugee camp. Yes. And when the army marched out and when they were going uh, back or supply trains back and forth wherever they were at from Rolla, mm -hmm. the villains often would fall in line and go to Rolla. And that, and that was true whether they were uh, northern leaning or southern leaning. They were trying to get to somewhere that was safe and they could have food and shelter. Um, yeah. And so someone in that circumstance very uh, may well have gotten there by the route and been traversing the ridges and maybe uh baby and or her died at that time yeah. mm -hmm. it's it's haunting um mm -hmm. no pun intended it's a it's a tragic story it is uh, it is visually very evocative it really is and it, it really and, I, is. And, and i think as you noted it it speaks to a specific time in sort of that early mid settlement period mm -hmm. when we're dealing with uh a really rough uh, era. Very rough and a lot of dislocation. So, I mean, that, that sort of that wandering spirit makes sense. Yes. And it's, uh, uh, so Ozark Madonna. And, mm -hmm. uh, and of course, if anybody has had any personal experiences in that regard, we'd love to hear about that as well. Definitely. So where, where would you like to begin with, uh, Ozarks UFOs. 
Hmm. Well, I guess we could kind of start at the beginning, um, which is a, an odd story that again is somewhere between, <laughs> well, I don't think it's folklore because there were sightings at the time from California to Nebraska to Kansas to yes. Arkansas to Texas. So, <laughs> so it's not, not folklore, but, um, and, but, Maybe some aspects of urban legend too, or at least over time. <laughs> Airships of 1897. Yes, I I find it fascinating. It's, <clears throat> um, uh, in terms of, mm, in terms of the the era of uh, of yellow journalism. I wish I could say something snarky there, but I won't. Um, in terms of the era of Gila journalism, it, the simple fact that we have a, a uh, you know, newspaper documentation on these airships mm -hmm. does not guarantee that they existed. I think that's an important dynamic. That is true. And, and what I find interesting about the Arkansas case the arkansas mm -hmm. sighting two things one it was two law officers and they signed sworn affidavits uh as to their experience so it's you're actually getting their version not the reporters which is good yes and <clears throat> that so in in we we've got two both both of these are are in association with the hot springs area which mm -hmm. is in the washita mountains um which is you know but there were sightings yes other places in the ozarks and and all the way back to california so it affects yes. the entire region it is <clears throat> in 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 these particular ones we've gotten one from april 22nd 1897 we have one from may 7th 1897 uh the one from may 7th yeah as you noted two two officers of the law uh john sumter and uh john mclemore mclemore um seeing bright lights and the, of course the first half of this just sounds like a uf like we're fine we're, we're watching steven spielberg's et bright lights in the yeah. sky horses refusing to go any further, following the lights on a rainy evening, and then finding a, quote, cigar-shaped vessel approximately 60 feet long with men walking around it, one getting water from the creek. Uh, they said that they were traveling the country in the airship, offered the two men uh, a ride to get out of the rain. They said they'd prefer to get wet rather than ride on this thing. <laughs> uh <laughs> and, and and no people this is before the wright brothers this is before air, airplanes so yes there and, were hot air balloons etc but mm -hmm. this was also mechanical they yes mechanical. and and <laughs> the the of course the presence never confirmed some believed it to be a hoax uh there to me there is such an element of jules verne a bit uh this and i'm not saying that to imply that it was or was not a hoax either way right uh, but there is a a a jules vernian element that instead of the the nautilus rising out of the deep to surprise some fishermen it's uh you know the nautilus descending from the sky to surprise a couple of uh you know arkansas lawmen exactly and, and and there were other very similar accounts in other places but to be honest these the, these two uh are, are probably the most credible and and were willing to sign affidavits you know which you know considering the fact that it you know in 1897 this was would be viewed as a very outlandish uh story that yeah. they were adamant enough to be willing to sign affidavits and have them printed in the newspaper um says something for the uh credibility 
because it, does. it, it certainly could have hurt their, their, you know, they could have lost their jobs or lost reputation in town, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And I think those, again, socially or socio contextually taking that into account is very important. I find it really interesting that there's only really a handful of days between that report and the other one, which uh -huh. was, pardon me, published in the Arkansas Gazette. And it was a, you know, a, a firsthand account uh, from a man named Jim Hooten, who is an Iron Mountain Railroad conductor, mm -hmm. who I took some time. What's, you know, what's that? Again, someone with, with a lot of responsibility that, you know, hopefully some credibility. Yes. And, and his, uh, the article that was published in 1897 is very specific. Mm hmm and, and, and of course, for people who might be wondering, uh, we are defining UFO by its traditional title or its real acronym, an unidentified flying object. And indeed, we have a flying object that is quite unidentified. It's still to this day. Yes. Um, <clears throat> uh, Hooten's encounter with the airship took place around Holman, Arkansas. Um, it was between three and six o'clock in the afternoon. And he heard what sounded like an air pump on a locomotive, and he went to investigate. Now, the thing that is, you know, veering into um, steampunk category uh -huh. by, by this <clears throat> was said, you know, to be the famous airship seen around the country. But the, the mechanical descriptions of the airship imply that it is using some sort of fan jets with compressed air to yes. <laughs> move w without, the, yeah. uh, without the dirigible, potentially. Right. Uh, or maybe they just left that part out of the story. But it sounds like, in this account, it sounds like a heavier than air yeah. craft. It, it does. And this is 1897, not, not 1903. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> and so uh, you, you, are le you are left with credible witnesses who say, you know, this is basically a machine and particularly the lawmen uh, never question that you know these these are men who are running it, um, yes. but and and for that reason, I think most people just left it at that something was being you know some invention was being explored, yeah, uh, and um, but it um, it became a, a an ET story actually in the sixties. Uh, because of a sighting in Aurora, Texas in 1897, but supposedly the airship crashed. Mm. And av post Roswell, they, um, it morphed into a story of a uh, alien ET pilot who dies and they bury him in the cemetery and it's an unmarked grave and people try to get them to um, uh, exhume the grave and the city won't do it and so it's become this very large legend that there's this you know proof of alien life buried in the cemetery at Aurora, Texas. <laughs> and it's mm. Which is not a bad segue to April 1941, Cape Girardeau. Yes, <laughs> yes. Um, which, if if this event happened, it um, it actually um, would mean that um, Roswell was not the first um, down craft. <laughs> right. <laughs> very, very true. Um, yeah, so, so for, you know, I guess point of reference, uh, the Roswell incident of Roswell, New Mexico took place on July 8th of 1947. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm generally assuming that everybody's familiar with Roswell because it's just part of our popular culture, but 
basically flying saucer crashes and there's aliens inside. Exactly. Allegedly. Allegedly. Now, according to this story, Cape, basically Cape Girardeau area, in 1941, mm -hmm. uh, there's a crash. Yes. Uh, Reverend uh, is called out to, to give last rites, and he's assuming it's a small plane. Mm -hmm. And the story goes that when he gets there, it's by the airfield, um, that it's not a plane, it's a flying saucer, and he ends up giving last rites to the pilot. <laughs> yes, uh, or what we assume to be the pilot. Mm -hmm. um, there, there's a couple of different mm, definitions. Uh, <clears throat> the, I, I did find this interesting. I, I want to dig a little bit more into it. I'm certainly welcome, you know, invite input on this. Reverend William Huffman, Red Star Baptist Church. Um, documentably, um, Huffman was pastor of Red Star Baptist Church mm -hmm. during yeah. this time. Yeah, that's no so, question. <clears throat> that's, that's documentable um the the story tends to seems to come through charlotte mann uh in the 1980s uh that and her grandfather was huffman yes and <clears throat> there's uh you know rumors of photographs but there are no photographs Right, they they apparently have disappeared. Um, supposedly two copies of a photograph of of the of the ET. Uh, mm -hmm. One interesting fact is that um, the brother of the sheriff at the time later did sign an affidavit saying that his brother later recounted the story to him, mm -hmm. and um, so, which uh, mirrored um, Huffman's account. Or yeah. his granddaughter's account, of what he yes. said. Because, you know, uh, candidly, he did not tell a story in his lifetime. Yes. Yes. At least publicly. And there, there's the, the, as the narrative goes, that he did tell his wife and his sons ostensibly mm -hmm. that night. Right. Told the family, but it wasn't, he mm -hmm. didn't report it that. Why? No. Uh, there is the, the account. Again, a lot of this. What what seems to be certain is that something happened. Yeah. Uh, what the something was seems to be in question. Exactly. It does. It does appear that the army came out and retrieved something. Of course, mm -hmm. it could have been. It could have just been an airplane. <laughs> we don't. That know. is very true. Mm -hmm. But I mean, uh, I have even read some accounts that you know supposedly. Um, Harry Truman, who was senator at the time, was called was was in Missouri and ended up going to the site the next day and observing the crash site. Uh, but I, I think that is sort of um, secondhand, secondhand, secondhand type versions. So I mean, mm -hmm. it kind of morphed after the story came out. Mm -hmm. There's, you know, we're we're primarily currently making references from from two different documentation points mm -hmm. uh and even between those two points there there are differences yes um one and this is this could be just a uh I, I may be off but uh on this um and traditionally so that well i guess we don't really know it's southern baptist but traditionally baptists don't administer last rites that's catholicism exactly yeah so I, I found that curious too but uh one of the other <laughs> um the one of the other references <clears throat> simply says that that uh reverend huffman was called to pray over them which yeah i might be splitting hairs but that seems a little more baptist and i am baptist so yeah that's uh there's there's that reference um one of the three occupants of the craft still being alive at the time that he got there right. uh, one one account says that they were three and a half to four feet tall uh gray creatures with big black eyes and long thin 
arms and legs and the creature expired in front of him mm -hmm. um the the other current one similar similar description three gray alien type beings about five feet tall with big heads and big black eyes mm -hmm. <clears throat> again but, but the the public um statements about it were made after the popularization of the image of the gray alien Yes, <clears throat> and that is that is one of the concerning aspects mm -hmm. uh, of this. I would like to get the book um, Mo Forty One: The Bombshell Before Roswell, mm -hmm. uh, written by Paul Blake Smith. I really would like to get my hands on a copy of that book and read it. It's and and this is there. There's there is no question but what there are issues surrounding this story yep <laughs> oh yeah i mean it, it, it certainly it certainly has it certainly has its issues um and it may have happened just exactly the way that it's been related but and, um yes. you know it like so many of these stories there's you know there is not that smoking gun of evidence so <laughs> and and i think that something that's of, of particular interest to this type of uh, of element that folks can find very frustrating especially um authority figures can find particularly frustrating mm -hmm. is that once you once you cross the line of established civilization anything is up <laughs> for grabs and you you certainly can have uh, the most well-meaning and well-documented uh, uh, authority um, figures who could one hundred percent be being transparent and telling the truth. And for example, saying we have no record uh, of this. This didn't happen. This is all made up. And it really is all made up. Yeah. And yet, That's very true. <laughs> uh, and yet, we, you know, we we've, we've already. It, it's a it's an interesting what I would really kind of classify as a Bermuda Triangle of the mind, uh, because we have all <laughs> we we've already stepped over the barrier. Uh, you know, we've stepped past the caution tape that that says everything in, that we know is completely settled and authority structures would never ever ever lie to us most people would not have said that in 1941 but again when we're hearing a version relayed 40 years later it's hard to know mm -hmm. so i i I, I think it's just it's such a it's such an interesting place of not knowing and and, and something that I find that, that I think that our our uh, traditional authoritarian structures have to find extraordinarily frustrating is that they keep telling us no there's nothing to see there and yet the public once they get to a certain point simply aren't believing them yeah it kind of goes back to the Black Panther. <laughs> it, really, it really, really does. And, you know, along with that, when you combine uh, the, the, the stories, uh, the, the story associated with uh, the Cape Girardeau uh, mm -hmm. extraterrestrial crash with certainly lots of other um, observable UFO phenomena, but particularly the uh piedmont uh mm -hmm. ufo series yeah what that uh, witnesses we're, we're we're suddenly within the territory that you can you know authority structures can deny 
uh, the, the observations of hundreds of everyday people all they want to, but you can no longer deny the fact that these people saw something. Exactly. And this was all um, documented at the time, not for you didn't hear about it 40 years later. Um, yes. And, um, you know, it, 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 it's one of the more interesting um, UFO stories that I've heard really from anywhere. Um, uh, a lot of these store, a lot of the witnesses give very consistent descriptions. Uh, yeah. Been being in different locations, even, you know, 50, 60 miles apart. Um, describing the craft exactly the same. Um, <clears throat> movements and the lights and so forth. Um, and it happened over uh, a period of time too. Yes, a couple about two months. Yeah. Um, yeah. And people, for people who are wondering, it, it's approximately appears to have started February twenty first of nineteen seventy three near Piedmont, Missouri. Right, right. Which ironically isn't you know that that far from Cape Girardeau, but <laughs> no, it's really not. <laughs> it's really, really not. <laughs> And there, there's, <clears throat> so, so during, during this particular time, uh, over 500 reports of mm -hmm. UFO sightings uh, within that immediate region. Right. And, and, and it was uh, clear over to um, uh, Southern Illinois. Yes. And as, as you noted, uh, something that is is also consistent is the the general veracity of the people. We're dealing with people who were were well known in the community, respected, well liked. Um, in in some cases, the the people uh, making these reports were 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 news people. Uh, they were radio people, um, teachers. and it was just yes, yes, uh, high school teachers. <clears throat> And so it's very difficult to discount this, uh, this series of 500, approximately, uh, approximately 500 events uh, as just people's imagination or pollen or stratospheric or atmospheric swamp conditions, gas. Or <laughs> swamp gas or weather balloons or any of those things. Yeah. And, and the consistency in the details, that's the thing is usually when if, if it's sort of a mass hysteria thing and, you know, people just doing a copycat reporting, you won't mm -hmm. get as, as consistent a details as you did in this. Yes. <clears throat> the, certainly the, uh, you know, elements uh, within the accounts and deal with, with things that appear to be craft. Mm-hmm. Uh, does not appear to be natural phenomena. No. Uh, uh, they very much describe structure, mechanical uh, mm -hmm. uh, obvious. Yeah, and and they're flying. Uh, that's an important <laughs> important factor in yes. this. Um, and some during <laughs> the day as well as at night too. Yes, uh, you know the the first craft, uh, four lights that look like portholes. And then be the lights being red, green, amber, and white. Um, and then uh, all of a sudden the lights went directly up in the air with absolutely no noise and just disappeared over the hill. Also in terms of, of, uh, of UFO phenomena, and this seems to be observable throughout this and plenty of other times, is that the apparent craft moves in ways that defy regular physics. Yes. And, 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 and described in ways that even today we um, we don't have craft that at least the public's aware of that could maneuver that way. Exactly. Um, <clears throat> I also have I, as I was as I was reviewing the the literature on the subject, I could not help but think of the opening scenes of Close Encounters of the Third Kind, uh, <laughs> particularly with. And it's also, I think, incredibly important to note that this documentation was provided in news outlets prior yes. to Close Encounters of the Third Kind. 
So, oh yes, definitely. Um, yes. By by a number of years, so there's no way that you could say, oh, a whole bunch of people went and watched a Steven Spielberg movie and then decided this is what they saw. It's yeah. documentably would be the other way around. Um, but the um, around 9 p.m. March 1st, 1973, uh, Earl Turnbow uh, was on Highway 49, passed over a hill in the and spotted something quote lit up like a circus hovering over the road in front of him um the lights went out within seconds and presumably the object escaped in the darkness and then um two weeks later march 14th 1973 uh earl earl had three sightings this one was driving through the same area in a thunderstorm, he saw an amber light hovering 30 feet above a field less than 200 yards from him. Uh, I slowed down and watched for five to 10 minutes. When the lightning flashed, I could see a dome shape with a sort of an antenna on top. The amber light was shining from the antenna. All the other lights were off. I would say that the thing was between 15 and 20 feet in diameter, and it wasn't making any noise at all. That, again, coming back to that consistency mm -hmm. um the the last one being a week later i was feeding cattle at the farm just about dark and i saw this thing come over brushy creek it was about a thousand feet in the air and shaped like a top i couldn't tell if it was rotating or if the lights were just flashing the lights were yellow green and red uh they could have been portholes for all i know the object sailed over the farm and did not make a sound no sound of propulsion is very consistent Yes. And, you know, of course, in post 1950s and post B sci fi movies, the whole concept of the flying saucer, quote unquote, is almost considered cliche and and silly. And yet, through so many of these uh, recollections and these personal experiences, what people are describing is a flying saucer. <laughs> yeah, I yeah <laughs> i can't deny that because i've had that experience <laughs> exactly exactly which you know now i mean if you, do you want to share because you I, I can I've, I've i've shared on here before um mm -hmm. uh i was well i think a senior in high school it was summertime i was going to pick up a friend we were going to go bowling it was about 7 seven thirty in the evening i mean it was sunny the weather's good I was on 96 Highway north of Joplin, no one else on the road. And I see a light over the highway seeming to come towards me from a distance. At first, I figured it was a helicopter, maybe heading to a hospital. Um, as it got closer, realized it wasn't a helicopter and um, ended up being some sort of craft. And, and I will say, and I still, you know, have to wonder if it wasn't some, you know, man-made. Uh, that was my assumption, something military. Um, it was circular, uh, kind of like two inverted plates, saucers uh, with a flat band um, between them uh, and actually two, you know, one rotating one direction, one rotating the other and had uh, lights on that flat center panel, those two center panels um no noise i rolled i turned the radio off i rolled down the window um no noise whatsoever um uh a light at came out it hit the uh, uh the pavement i wondered okay is this it <laughs> am i dead or what uh and there was nowhere to go um not close to a house or anything uh, so I, I just sat there and it hovered maybe 30 45 seconds uh and it was just about the width of the roadbed which is 26 feet um and then it literally took off at a 45 degree angle and was completely out of sight in a fraction of a second wow and which never seen i still have never seen anything that i could say oh that you know they were testing that or something right <clears throat> and this is and again very very consistent with these kind of reports 
I, I do think, and I'm, I'm curious as to your thoughts, you take the Cape Girardeau, the alleged Cape Girardeau incident, and you take the, the documented Piedmont incident, you put those two together, just those two is more than almost any other region. And, and yet the Ozarks are not, nobody's, nobody's heading to the Ozarks, you know, in droves for UFO tourism. Not for tourism. Um, there are researchers that uh, are very interested. And they they uh, they call it the 30, 38th parallel uh, corridor um, through southern Missouri. Um, that uh, and that there's a, a other notable sightings uh, incidents along that same trajectory east and west of Missouri. Um, and of course, there's a number of Air Force bases in the region. Um, yeah. you know, Southern Illinois, uh, Central Missouri. I mean, you know, when when we when we the stealth uh, bombers are based in Missouri, when we flew them to the Middle East, they flew from Missouri to the Middle East and back every day. Yes. So <laughs> exactly, which is. <clears throat> There was um, the, the uh, most prominent uh, individual interviewed um, high school basketball coach for the Piedmont incident, high school mm -hmm. basketball coach, uh, Reggie Bone, also had a really unique experience before mm -hmm. uh, all of this, um, the, the, the the rash of sightings took place between february to april of 1973 but in christmas the christmas season of 1971 um reggie was driving through uh, a deserted section of, of brushy creek brushy creek area around two in the morning and quote says Suddenly, we saw this fellow walking up the road toward us in a frogman's outfit. He was wearing flippers or something, resembling them on his feet, and he was carrying something in his hands. We couldn't see very well. Visibility was poor, so we couldn't see his face, but his body was completely covered. The suit didn't look wet. Black River is about a quarter mile from the road, and it's rather inaccessible from the point where we ran to this figure. The temperature was well below freezing, and I don't know of anyone who lives in the area. We were taken aback that nobody even said anything for several miles. And then finally someone asked, did you see that? <laughs> so, you know, in part, it sounds like, you know, was, was there something being experimented with that, you know, either didn't pan, you know, pan out or, <laughs> or <laughs> somehow is still classified. Or, uh, or could possibly still be classified. The other, and, and this is, is a continuing theme that and I can't tell you why um, but I find this vastly unsettling is UFOs in water yeah and the underwater yeah an, an unidentified flying object that comes out of uh, a lake and we have reports from right around us mm -hmm. uh, observing this kind of phenomena and this kind of phenomena, this kind of behavior, um, a an underwater UFO was associated with the Piedmont incidences. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, in, in this case, it was March 21st of 1973. Gene Coleman and Kathy Leach were crossing Clearwater Dam around 9 p.m. and they saw an object rise from the lake. They were first alerted by a red flash in the lake. They stopped their cars. They got out to see blinking lights ascending. And each time a red light flashed, the object got brighter. We could see it climbing, Mrs. Coleman said. It looked like the lights were red, white, and yellow. There was no sound. We tried to make out the shape, but each time the lights went out, we could see nothing. We watched it for four or five minutes until it circled out of sight. And, and you know, there, there's different places um, around the world that they're repeated that these under the submersible flying objects. Um, one of the more uh, famous is at Catalina Island off 
LA um, that uh, there's a lot of sightings there. And of course that um, they speculate whether it's related to the, the battle of LA, the so-called battle of LA in World mm, War II, mm -hmm. which um, basically they, they saw a UFO, um, uh, was not a plane, was not a dirigible, was not a balloon. Um, and they fought, they, they shot thousands of rounds at this thing. <laughs> yes. And, and this was and, early, shortly after Pearl Harbor. Yeah, about six months after, I think. And, um, and it just disappeared from sight. And mm -hmm. they never could, they never really did figure out what happened. Yes. Um, and so, you know, all these submersible uh, sightings are not very far from there. You know, that's probably the no. more famous one. <laughs> it is. Yes. And well, and you, you move forward to um, video that actually did get declassified in terms of U.S. Navy footage in the South mm -hmm. Pacific off of the South American coast. Mm -hmm. we, we seem to have vehicles of unknown origin emerging from the ocean. Something, something's going on. Yeah. I, there was, uh, um, coming back to the, the Piedmont incidences, uh, Ken Johnson, who owned the Piedmont boat dock, said that shortly before the, they saw the UFOs leaving the water, there was unnamed campers who had told Johnson that they had seen, quote, a bright light moving right under the surface of the lake. They aimed a flashlight beam at the traveling light and it went out. Interesting. So it's whatever it was responded to a light beam flat turned on. And, um, I mean, mm, that's like B-movie sci-fi horror combined with Jaws right there. It is, but here, here's here's the 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 uh, devil's advocate side. If yes. it, it, if um, if there were to be uh, ETs, yes, surveilling the the planet. I'm not saying there are, um, uh -huh. but it would make a lot of sense to hide underwater because we we don't know a whole lot about underwater areas and, and then when you get out into the oceans then you know we we really don't know anything <laughs> you know yes. uh, we are That's just true. now with gps and in high resolution satellites getting to where things like that might be observed so that's very very true if you, and, if you were going to do that then that underwater would make a lot of sense to be perfectly honest it does. And regardless of the, the origin of said unknown craft, um, yeah. if it seems to be capable of doing all of these things in the air, there's a suggestion that there's no reason why it couldn't do it underwater. Exactly. And if it, if it were a military project and it were perfected, it would make a heck of a, a weapon. Uh, yes, it would. <laughs> yes, it would. <laughs> Which is a little terrifying in and of itself. Uh, now, I think one of, one of the really fascinating aspects to come out of this um, is research done uh, by Harley Rutledge. Yes, I'm very fascinating. And actually, you know, I, I introduced to the Ozarks that really uh, Dr. Rutledge was the first um, academic to, to really try to study uh, UFOs. Yes, and, and has apparently done or did an, an extraordinary job. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's interesting that we don't hear more about his particular published research. Yeah, um, and I'm not really sure why, but it's, it really does seem that he's not gotten the, at least the public uh, uh, coverage that some others have. Um, yeah. Of course, he was a little earlier in the game than some of them. That might be part of it. It, it could be. And there, there is some, some conjecture in terms of that. For people who might be wondering, um, he, was a, he was a physics professor, mm -hmm. uh, graduated from the University of Missouri in 1966, and, uh, and taught at Southeast Missouri State University from, let's see, um, 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 shortly after 
after he graduated until uh, at least into the 90s. Uh -huh. So <clears throat> not a um, not a not a not a crackpot. No, doesn't sound like a crackpot at all. And um, from everything that I've read, very methodical and very very thorough. So um, yeah. And <clears throat> the uh, um, essentially the the Piedmont incident making the news and with uh, with Rutledge being a physics professor in that region was essentially challenged by someone to say, hey, can you figure this out or at least observe and document? Exactly. And then it, it then it basically became a, a project for him for the rest of his life. It, yes. And documented a lot that uh, and documented some elements that I'm going to oh say are downright creepy one of them being uh the concept of a pseudo star yes oh <laughs> uh, what appears to be a ufo mm -hmm. a light in the sky positioning itself to appear as part of an existing constellation if observed from the ground but again Certainly not. Certainly something that uh, if, if you had that technology, that it, it's not <laughs> that difficult to math to figure out to do. No, actually, um, something that you know, pretty <laughs> obvious for camouflage. Yes, the idea of a of a star that shouldn't have been there. <sighs> mm, often is what I thought was. Um, very again adding to the creepy factor of this uh <laughs> when the pseudo star was being observed mm -hmm. it would often take off rapidly sometimes blinking its light <laughs> waving i guess oh uh, and that that <clears throat> and and this one i think a lot of people who have seen um ufos would uh, would concur in terms of this that um, they they did triangulation and timing equipment to measure speed distance and size of the objects uh -huh. but many of the calculations show that the objects accelerated instantly to thousands of miles per hour uh, and made sudden impossible right angle turns and, and again that that would be that would be my experience um, yeah that the acceleration and their trajectory just is not something that uh, we have anything close to. And certainly, if it were if it were piloted uh, by a human, I'm not sure that, that the G force would be. I, I can't even imagine. No, no. It it <clears throat> reminds me of uh, you know when. Picard and Data and the shuttlecraft and it loses its inertial dampeners and then they just yes. start shaking back and forth. Uh -huh. uh, <laughs> <laughs> the, <laughs> I I uh, <laughs> I blame next generation for for most of what I don't know. <laughs> uh, the <laughs> the um, mm, military. So uh, just to give like a, a, a general overview um rutledge's research took place over seven years mm -hmm. uh included 35 physical scientists engineers university students and university students um 158 different viewing stations being employed uh with 620 total observers and over that seven-year study there was 157 documented sightings documenting 178 different ufos i mean that's pretty impressive you know it really is it really really is and the the all of this within that piedmont cape Girardeau, mississippi river uh eastern Air. ozarks area there's 
an, another thing. <laughs> um, that was was noted, and I found this. Um, uh, Rutledge noted in later interviews that some balls of plasma, uh, two to six inches in diameter, would actually follow him around and even appear inside buildings. Well, this sounds a lot like the spook light. <laughs> Doesn't it? <laughs> yes. <laughs> and, and that Rutledge and his team concluded that the objects were aware of their presence upon being observed and would interact with them, sometimes seemingly toy with them. Again, there are instances of the spook light that, that, that fits. Yes. And, you know, it, it, uh, it, it bears questioning. Um, and I, I, I'm, I'm going to hate myself for what I'm about to say. <clears throat> Am I going to hate you, Roy? Yes, yes, you are. (laughs) (laughs) And and the reason is that I'm going to be referencing the end of Indiana Jones and the Legend of the Crystal Skull. Um, (laughs) And I hate that. I really do. (laughs) And mainly because when I first heard it, I thought it was the most ludicrous thing that I'd ever heard. Because George Lucas was getting a lot of crap for putting aliens in a... a, um, in, in an Indiana Jones film, yeah. and his response was, "They're not aliens; they're inter- interdimensional beings." <laughs> and at the time, I'm like, "That's not a dodge. That is not even. You're not even sidestepping. You're just <laughs> lost in your own little world, George. I don't know what happened. This is ridiculous. Yeah. And why did you have Shia LaBeouf?" Anyway, um, but <clears throat> now we're looking at the, the absolute inexplicable physics of, say, the spook light. Yeah. Uh, and other earth lights. Mm-hmm. Then we're looking at the inexplicable of a variety of observable UFO aerial phenomena, mm-hmm. sometimes transitioning over to submersible phenomena. Yeah. Um, and we're seeing some sort of weird crossover with physics that we don't understand, which do begin to suggest, as much as I hate to use the term, uh, interdimension as opposed to, um, outer space. Very, I mean, that's, that's very potentially true or some sort of multiverse, um, um, and and to be perfectly honest, the, those theories are um, are being examined a lot in in the paranormal field um, mm-hmm. for uh, what are perceived as hauntings. Uh, yes. And to be perfectly honest, I, I think it's possible. I think I think I do think that quantum mechanics and quantum physics are ultimately probably going to answer some of these questions, and particularly with <laughs> situations like Piedmont I mean I, I think that's mm-hmm. where your answers are um and uh, yeah in a way I kind of hate it but <laughs> 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 too but it, you know there may be something there there may be something there um for, for anyone that's someone what are you guys talking about um sort of multiverse theory uh is that um basically the, we have our universe there are other universes multitudes of them um that exist and we're all in each of these universes but details might be different um Mm -hmm. you know and another one you know i might be the queen of england and josh may be a pirate on the high seas (laughs) or something i don't know um but um and uh Theoretically, uh, you know, Stephen Hawking, you know, proved the existence of the multiverse. Um, and I guess the best way to kind of describe that is uh, an interview I saw him in a number of years ago. Uh, the interviewer was asking him about this, and he kind of you see the light bulb go off for the interviewer, and he goes, 
oh, so you mean that there's a world where I'm smarter than you? And Hawking says, yes. And there's one where you're funnier than me too. <laughs> oh, exactly. So, <laughs> or, or just imagine Dr. Strange. <laughs> the... <laughs> In, in this, um, and I found this is maybe just a, a good concluding point for the, the Piedmont case um, in, in reference over uh, to Mount, Mount St. Helens, that there was observable activity in regards to Mount St. Helens up to yeah. the point that it erupted. Mm -hmm. And that the Missouri lights uh, were observed up until until 1976, and in March of 1976, a uh, five point uh, earthquake hit the New Madrid fault zone. Right. It was the largest earthquake in that area that had taken place in some time, and then that ended. So, a an idea that somehow this uh, Earth activity or seismic activity might be connected to the phenomena. Right. And, and there are places that um, where you do have fault lines that energy is released and sort of some sort of plasma like energy or ball lightning is released. Mm -hmm. uh, and in fact, there are there are some theories that the Gordon light uh, in Arkansas is based on tectonic stressors, seismic yes. stress um, mm -hmm. that release energy and cause lights. Um, yeah. And so. I mean, it's maybe I, although that doesn't really, de, that doesn't account for the descriptions of, of the ships uh, right. and, and things like that. But of course, on the, you know, what's the chicken and the egg? If something was going on that was um, releasing this huge amount of energy, mm -hmm. was either the military studying it, or if we are talking about ET, were they attracted for whatever reason gathering energy or whatever mm -hmm. which you know, is all and, and i think one of the things that mm, people may find unsettling or uh enticing one of the two is that once you step beyond the bounds of normal yeah that almost anything is up for conjecture it can be you know and you know we just try try to put it in realms of you know at least possibility possibility mm -hmm. at least within the framework of the rules that we are aware of yes and there's uh and i'm not sure exactly when this this number um has ended or if this is a a, a continuing count up till 2022 um but approximately speaking since 1974 the national ufo reporting center documents Mm -hmm. uh, sightings and within uh, from 1974 until at least relatively recent times Missouri has been sitting at uh, almost 2,000 sightings right and I think I think that was dated 2018 or 2019 I believe so okay fairly recent so, and that of course is not taking into account you know individual sightings that obviously they're not reported not reported or not or or document uh, enough to conclude that it's possible sighting yeah. yes and uh the same the same reporting has arkansas sitting at 780 something ish um currently which, so. which, again, makes you wonder about the 38th parallel and a little closer to the the air force bases it does it really does um you know there's the thing that once and i I've, I've spoken to a number of people um you know you've had a personal experience dale's had experience within the last year and a half uh, i have not uh, but i've certainly talked to a number of people who who have um and it's very specific mm -hmm. and i and i think that's where just like the uh, the observations of the panthers who shouldn't be there um that it really becomes a, an issue in response to authoritarian structures that deny individuals' personal existence because the, the denial uh, really is extraordinarily hollow based on an individual's observation. 
exactly exactly and you know and that's one thing is you know i had my experience and you know i described what what i saw i don't conclude the source of it or you know where yeah. it came from you know mm -hmm. i still you know i would i would still in many ways prefer to say it's some sort of secret program but i just yes. i can't explain it because of what i observe right <clears throat> and, and i think that's very fair and most of the people that i've talked to um are are very very happy you know they're not uncomfortable saying i don't know but yeah. i know that i saw it yeah exactly and you know, so and that's that's not a that's not an unreasonable or you know country bumpkin we need to dismiss this out of out of hand response we we a lot a lot of things that we rely on in our society are based on observations yes and, and accepting a witness's um version of what they saw yes yes it is um uh, <clears throat> Now, once you get in, you know, you can come back to the Cape, uh, Cape Girardeau crash, you can deal with Roswell, you can deal with a number of these incidences. Um, once you get into speculation about extraterrestrial life, mm -hmm. it, it certainly gets messier. It gets messier. Well, well, for a number of reasons. One, it's, you know, it's not empirically proven. Statistically, it's easy to say that, you know, it's very unlikely you know, mm -hmm. between stars and star systems, et cetera. Um, and then of course you, you have the added uh, factor that if that's the case, it, it uh, uh, certainly casts a question upon a lot of people's worldviews. It does. <clears throat> and, it and, does. And people are very uncomfortable with that they are they are and and i think um uh authority authority structures of, of many different kinds mm -hmm. are, are 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 uncomfortable with that and and maybe uncomfortable with the question of how you know the the larger population mass would respond to that kind of information exactly what you know are you are you going to have mass hysteria are you going to have panics you know i mean um yeah. Are you going to have to declare martial law to calm people down? I mean, and right. those are all legitimate questions, to be perfectly honest. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's <clears throat> no, we'll just have a run on toilet paper. <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah. aliens. Why wouldn't we? So. <laughs> I have nothing for that. I have nothing. <laughs> I I did think, um, you know, there, there's <clears throat> in in Northwest Arkansas in the '70s there was a rash of of observable um, phenomena. Yeah, I think it was '76, uh, I believe, or something like that. I, I believe so as well. And and also around Fort Smith, uh, Northwest Arkansas, down there to, to, toward Fort Smith. And then a um, great article by David A. Ferris entitled Saucers Over Oklahoma, uh -huh. in detailing this summer of 1965 occurrence that, from, from what I can tell, pretty much everybody and their cousin and their dog, when they looked out the window over this weekend, saw a UFO. Yeah, I mean, even more widespread than Piedmont in some ways. It sounds yes. like. Yeah, and and interesting as well that it that it, it seems that the you know the the uh, authorities in this regard from uh, local or state media to uh, police departments to uh, Air Force were all pretty much in open communication. Yeah saying we're we're seeing it we don't know what it is but we're seeing it yeah not denying that it was going on no and and, it, and for, for a large portion of uh, a large a large area too not just yeah. right 
wide, much wider than the Piedmont situation. Much, much more so. Um, uh, reports ultimately from Kansas, New Mexico, Colorado, Nebraska, and Wyoming, in addition to Oklahoma. And the Oklahoma sightings centered approximately from uh, Oklahoma City area all the way up to Tulsa. Mm -hmm. so, so, but again, you, you, again, you are pretty much just on the south side of the 38th <laughs> parallel there. <laughs> yes, you are. You really are. And, and for people, you know, wondering, well, what were they looking at? Things like an object having a blue-green center, a rotating light circling the midsection, mm -hmm. uh, rising abruptly into the night sky where it hovered for a few minutes before beginning to lose altitude and moving off to the north. That apparently was the first one. Um, I liked it. thought this was interesting. Uh, unnamed witness reported a saucer-type craft emerge from Lake Hefner, just north of Oklahoma City. Yeah, there you go. Uh, newsman Mike Buchanan, along with a highway patrol, um, more than 20 reports of UFOs en route toward Oklahoma City. <clears throat> um, uh, Tinker Air Force Base reported four UFOs on radar at 22,000 feet. Uh, people on the ground who saw them said they appear to be very bright, multicolored hovering and then flying off at high rates of speed, sometimes making sharp right angle turns. Um, 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 craft reported north of El Reno, moving east. Um, Hughes, who was a ufologist, a young ufologist along with six highway patrolmen and a reporter saying it looked like a light source, dominantly white and appeared to have a green glow around it. The UFOs also seem to be flashing red, white, and blue lights and hovering over the area for about an hour. Report after report after report of this. A lot, a lot of credible observers. Yes, and then it finally making its way up to the chain of command and apparently the Secretary of the Air Force Office of Information stating um, that the objects most likely observed were the planets or stars, Jupiter, Capella, uh, and Aldebaran, which are clearly visible in the eastern sky. Okay. <sighs> and that's why there are trust issues. That's why, yes, I mean, it's, yeah, it's, you know, yes, we, not that many people are going to all at the same time suddenly say, oh, this is a UFO and not Jupiter. <laughs> that coming out of the lake yes <laughs> that was that was certainly a planet over there um that <clears throat> and it, to me it is it is a little mind-boggling you know and it it reminds me there's there's i believe a 1950s early 60s uh observable very similar to this um formations of aerial craft mm -hmm. appearing over new mexico and, and again, very similar in terms of the, the, the number of individuals seeing it. Um, and then a, an official report uh, said that it was uh, cottonwood um, um, fluff. fluff. And, and I've observed cottonwood fluff and many, many times in my life. Mm -hmm. I never looked at it and said, wow, it's a formation of UFOs at 30,000 feet. Yeah, no. I know. Again, it's, you know, <laughs> just just a weather balloon, just some pollen in the atmosphere, uh, just the planet Jupiter uh, and, and the star Aldebaran. I mean, I'm a big fan of Aldebaran, uh, but <laughs> this, is, this is ludicrous. And again, this is why we have trust issues. Mm -hmm. and, and for, you know, uh, you know, PR folks in authoritarian positions who might be listening in tonight. This is why common people get very rankled about these sorts of things. Well, yeah, because it, it you know it stretches uh, common sense beyond any rationale. So it does, and it's not. Again, I think it's very important. We are not conjecturing in terms of extraterrestrial life. For all, you know, we're not conjecturing in terms of origin. We're not conjecturing in terms of, you know, going into a, you know, a deep dive on a B sci-fi movie. 
<laughs> but we are saying that this is observable phenomena and lots and lots of credible people have observed the phenomena. And instead of, yeah, instead of just saying, whoops, yeah, we don't know what it is either, you know, mm -hmm. let's say it's things that, that are fairly obvious that it's not. That's yes. the thing. You know, if they had a, if, if there was a, you know, an explanation, oh, it's this and you thought, okay, I can see that. That's fine, you know. But right. when, the, when all the rationales are just so obviously underwhelming, that yes, <laughs> or or ultimately insulting of the intelligence of the yeah of the individuals who have observed the the phenomena. Exactly, exactly, and that that's the thing that, and even if it happens in certain instances it, it it just has happened so many times over and over and over mm -hmm. since 1947 that uh i don't know how those information officers can believe themselves i'm sure they don't i i agreed and and i think and you know uh the the flip side of that we deal with this on a regular basis in terms of paranormal mm -hmm. there are individuals who experience paranormal occurrences mm -hmm. uh they they didn't plan to they in many cases they didn't want to yeah uh, and are by it. yes um in many cases they are um you know it it <clears throat> it's it's very unsettling for them because it was not part of their worldview and, they didn't and go suddenly, out looking for it. <laughs> mm -mm. And suddenly they have to deal with that and they have to rectify it. And it's very troubling mm -hmm. um, to, to then say to that person, uh, you're imagining things or you just want attention. Yeah. It is, to me, it, it's, it's the height of really of emotional cruelty. It is not, and, and you know, the caveat being that yeah, there are there are some people that do go out and seek those experiences and will stretch credibility. Yes, yes. and that's the other side. That is the other side, um, and, but it, it comes down to you know if you, you know, let's say Pmet, you know the 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 basketball coach and the the kids that you know they're driving down the highway coming back from a tournament or whatever uh you know they weren't out there looking for something you know no. that was the last thing on their mind yes and, and yet, there that's a big difference for me it it is and that's you know and 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 as you said the caveat of this is there there are individuals and i think there's kind of three categories there's the individuals who it's just it's not even within their framework until they experience it right um there's the the extreme other side um which is individuals who really want the attention and mm -hmm. and, and are willing to in some cases go to considerable lengths to get it yeah, I've, I've had those situations. Mm -hmm. And up. and that happens with paranormal. It happens with, with ufology. It, it happens in regular life. Oh, yeah. Just to, to, just to be the center of attention or whatever, yeah. Uh, and then I think that there's, there's others um, who, who are kind of not, that it's not attention seeking, but in some sense, we, I'm going to use the term we, uh, have essentially always known that there's other things. Yeah. Um, do we invest, do we enjoy investigating? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think it's important. And, and, and I feel that you and I both mm, uh, keep, a, keep a pretty good rein on the fact that we're approaching this phenomena from a pretty common sense point. It's not about the thrill exactly exactly at least we do our best yeah <clears throat> i you know i and i i find it fascinating but i there are elements to 
and, and I'm, I'm focusing primarily on, on the paranormal side, not the ufology side. Um, I, I find the, the various dynamics of the study of ufology to be fascinating. I've mm -hmm. not had any experiences. I'm not, I, I'm not particularly interested in seeing one. I mean, if I do, I do. If I don't, that's perfectly fine. Uh, I have had a number of paranormal experiences and even for whatever reason, just from, from a very early age, this has been an interest. And I think it's an interest filled by the sense that I, for what, again, for whatever reason, ancestry being a, certainly a, a probable cause that elements of the paranormal seem as real, if not more real than, than regular life in some cases. Exactly. Well, exactly. And, and certainly um, the possibility is, is not uh, stretched to the point of being ludicrous. Um, no. and, um, and for me, for the same reasons. You know? so, yes. But on the other hand, uh, I don't always assume I'm finding it either. So no. No, there's, and I think that that's, it's very, it's very important. I think individuals who do have a high sensitivity, essentially through the veil, um, do need to exercise a high degree of rationalism. That, that's true. I mean, there, I, I, I've known people who don't, they, they, they run full tilt um, with the assumptions and I, I bat pedal and try to come up with anything else first. Yes. Yes. And if I, then, at, then at that point, I, okay, then there's yeah. a possibility in it. Mm -hmm. And it's, and I think that's, I think that's a fair approach. I think it's a safer approach. I, I do too. I, I try trying to be as objective and <laughs> rational. <about it. laughs> and, and reasonably grounded. And it's, you know it's it's a process it is it is <laughs> <laughs> that may be a good uh point to uh to end on i think so i think so this has been a fun topic or topic it really, has. it really has it's been a great night and we appreciate everyone and we will see you next week absolutely thanks everybody and thank you lisa thanks josh night everyone night Nineteen ninety nine. We have a ghost in the machine. <laughs> I like my organ pyramid. I like it. It's it's not disconnecting. <laughs> Guess what, folks? <laughs> yeah, this for another hour. <laughs> we we may actually each have to <laughs> to end. <laughs> All right. Night everybody. Night everybody. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs>